Welcome to RCR Wireless News. I'm Martha DeGrasse, and I'm here today with Daryl Schooler. He is Principal Analyst for Intelligent Networks at Ovum. Daryl, thanks for being here. Sure, thanks. And also here is Bruce Miller. He is VP of Product Marketing at Xeris. Thanks so much, Bruce, for joining us. Sure. Hi, Martha. So our topic today is the iPhone 6 and the impact on carrier networks. And I, I think that we've seen Apple many times in the past really eventually drive and carrier investment in the network. And do you think that we're going to see this again this time around, Daryl? Yeah, and I think we might actually already be seeing some of those steps take place already. I mean, if you look at some of the earning calls that come out from the uh, vendors that have a strong position in North America, they're already talking about seeing um, investments going into increasing network capacity and densification. And I think, you know, part of it is, you know, obviously the iPhone launched the fact that it's now going to be supporting carrier aggregation and even higher speeds on Wi-Fi that um, it's taking place and will continue to take place. Yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about the Wi-Fi in particular. Of course, that, that is your area, Bruce. Do you think that people are going to start actually making voice calls on public Wi-Fi hotspots? Yeah, I, with that capability being added, um, you know, not all the carriers are going to support it immediately. Uh, the T-Mobile's been doing this for a while. Um, I think that this will will definitely be uh, a new use case, and, and people, if it is simple and and these things you know happen automatically, then certainly the the wireless voice uh, uptake will will certainly happen. Um, it's got to work though, and I think one of the, the the issues or the the concerns I would have is that a lot of these public Wi-Fi networks are just not natively set up to support voice. Um, they have not been designed for that, and, and voice over Wi-Fi is a bit more stringent in its requirements on the network. Um, and its capabilities. So, um, you know, there will be networks that work fine. There will be some that will probably have some challenges, and I think that'll that'll raise its head at, at some point along the way here. Now, Daryl, do you think that this is going to encourage the carriers to get more active about investing in carrier Wi-Fi? Yeah, I mean, if, it, if it, I expect it probably will, at least to the point that they're going to be more interested in making sure that. Um, Policy set around it, Hotspot 2.0. I think all those areas are probably going to have more importance now if you know they continue to roll out more voice over Wi-Fi. Certainly, looking into you know creating more trusted networks of their own because, as Bruce was saying, you, you, if people are going to use a lot of voice over Wi-Fi, they are going to end up going to more areas that are probably beyond the control of the operator, which can really impact the experience. I think that you know certainly going to lead them to want to do more investment on their own or at least partner up with other people to make sure that they have more trusted hotspots and certainly ones that um, have policies in place where they prioritize voice over other types of traffic. And then what about femto cells, residential small cells? I think um, you know a lot of those are maybe starting to incorporate some Wi-Fi. Do you think that uh, we're going to see an increasing demand for that with not only the iPhone 6, but a lot of these, these other phones that are going to start supporting uh, Wi-Fi calling and um, you know, the Femto market's been kind of tough and basically seems to forever hang around but not really take off. I actually, I could think the voice over Wi-Fi could actually really hurt the Femto market even more than it has in the past. And I think it even could impact, say, the uh, enterprise small cell market as well. Because it, cause voice over Wi-Fi kind of answers some of the challenges that have been out there in terms of you know, when you do it from a, a license perspective, you know, you see a lot of emphasis on how to have make sure it's controlled and, and managed against the macro. But if you go with the Wi-Fi and the different spectrum, you don't have that issue. On the enterprise side, you continue to see the discussion of who actually owns, say, the small cell when it's deployed. Is it enterprise equipment? Is it operator equipment? Voice over Wi-Fi, however, it's already placed in that kind of discussion, has already been settled. And secondly, with voice over Wi-Fi, if you start to have multiple operators supporting it, you know, you're really in a good place with BYOD. Licensed small cells are generally closed off just to one mobile operator. So I really think actually voice over Wi-Fi, if the adoption of it moves on to multiple operators, say when say if AT&T picks it up, it really could have say a negative impact on the small cell market. But but aren't the small cell vendors starting to integrate Wi-Fi? Yes, yes, they are. But at the same time, someone has to still buy them. Um, so that's why I think you know the voice over you know voice over Wi-Fi, especially I say the smaller end type enterprise area, 
I think you know, this really could have that impact there in terms of why deploy the small cell if the Wi-Fi is already there. It's trusted Wi-Fi. You can prioritize the voice there because it's a managed wireless LAN. Why go through the steps of even purchasing the small cell? Then? Because okay. the footprint of the Wi-Fi is already going to be there <clears throat> much more broadly today than, than the small cells. I think that's, that's yeah. the, a key point there. Yeah. Right. So are you hearing that, Bruce, from, uh, from companies that you work with, that they don't really need to look at cellular connectivity because they've got what they need with Wi-Fi? Well, I, I think it's it's a it's a process of, of moving there. There's still a lot of uh, you know people that we talk to and and, and um, organizations that we sell Wi-Fi to that are still deploying you know DAS systems and still trying to improve that cell coverage. So uh, you know the, the problem certainly has not been solved. I think Wi-Fi and with these Wi-Fi calling features, it will help. Um, so, but there's a balance, and and I, you know I don't I don't think either technology is is going to you know be the um, be the end all. I, I think there's a combination depending on the requirements, and and each company has a little bit different take on it. So, like we were saying, you know, some of these little small, um, small locations, you know, distributed enterprises may may well um, adopt a, a small cell type approach if it, if it makes sense. Um, it, it it really depends. But I think really this opens the door for for Wi-Fi in a you know to really help augment that uh, you know those issues that have been there, you know, with uh, in building coverage. Yeah, and you know we we're used to hearing about congested cellular networks, and now we're starting to hear the same for Wi-Fi. That a lot of Wi-Fi access points are getting overloaded. Bruce, what are some of the technologies that are helping to solve that? So yeah, good question. There's I think one of the things is just uh, the design of the network itself needs to be looked at differently than it was in the past, where you know it's it's definitely moved from a coverage-based world to density. So you design based on the number of expected users. And now, if you're running voice over that, you have to factor in that you have very latency, you know, packet loss sensitive traffic. So you need to have a, a robust network. Um, the move to five gig helps. There's a lot more spectrum there than there is in the legacy two four. So that helps improve quality if you can run the majority of your devices on on five gigahertz, uh, and quality will improve. Um, there's uh, you know QoS provisions and application level visibility and control that can come into play to ensure that uh, streaming media, you know, video, audio. Uh, voice that these are all prioritized accordingly, so that uh, you know, uh, download file downloads and you know iCloud backups and Dropbox syncups don't don't impact your your uh, your your latency sensitive uh, deterministic type of, of data patterns. So there's um, a number of things that have to put into play. A, an average Wi-Fi network may not deploy those. Um, certainly, consumer level products probably do not have those capabilities. So this is where an enterprise grade system needs to be designed from the start to support these services. Or you know, guaranteed we will be having some problems once people start to transition voice calls and, and other things over the Wi-Fi network. Okay, thanks. And you mentioned five gigahertz. We should say that the the iPhone six is at five gigahertz Wi-Fi, right? 802.11ac. It's the first one to support that. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's the first to support 11ac. The iPhone five actually introduced five gig support in 11n, and okay. now with the iPhone six, it supports 11ac, which is only in five gig. And it's three times faster. So, so the six is kind of a superset of everything. It has two, four, and five, but it now runs at even faster rates and with a faster processor and with a bigger screen. You know, we we expect to see these devices be moving a lot more data. Um, uh, you know, just in general over the wireless network. And and one thing that kind of got lost in the um, in the Apple announcement on Tuesday was the fact that they lowered iCloud storage rates by seventy percent or more and opened up much larger options. So. I, I see a, a bigger use of cloud-based services for offloading, you know, pictures, video, etc., and a lot of background syncing going on that people are going to be seeking Wi-Fi networks out for um, instead of cellular, where they're they're paying for that for that plan. So I think there are a lot of things point to the, these new devices as straining the wireless networks all the way around and adding a lot more capacity to them, requirements to them. Okay, Daryl, what do you think? Do you do you agree that that the iPhone six is going to Add some strain to the networks, and um, and if so, how do you think the carriers are going to respond to that? Oh yeah, I, I think certainly the iPhone six is going to tax the networks more than what we've seen in the past with the other ones, be it Wi-Fi, be it cellular. Um, so that's why I'm saying, you know, certainly, hopefully, the operators have been planning for this. When you talk about the network densification, improving their investments on Wi-Fi. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think the possibility, and that's probably, I think, one of the things that might have been overlooked. I mean, I know a lot of the popular press really focuses more on, say, 
consumer facing features of the iPhone software things of that nature but really some of the the, the less reported is the fact that this device really is just going to be faster in terms of the data connection as you get carrier aggregation being rolled out here in the United States and other parts of the world as you have the uh, 802.11 AC connection and you know as you were saying also the, the iCloud is a good example too where you're really going to see more emphasis or more reasons for people to be taxing the uplink connection as well um, and, you know might you know I don't think, think we're going to go back to the days when we had the very first iPhones come out and you had all the horror stories coming out like South by Southwest and things of that nature I mean I have confidence that the operators learned their lessons from that but certainly it's going to be something similar to that in terms of I think this phone really steps up the uh, network impact versus say like the the going to the 5 and the 5S did. I think the 6 is a much bigger jump in terms of the network. Right, okay. All right, well before we finish I would like to go back to to technologies that can make Wi-Fi even more robust. We haven't really talked about multi-user MIMO but we have seen a lot of chip makers launching those types of solutions uh, in the first half of this year. So Daryl, can you give us a little bit of, of insight about that and how that plays into all this? Yeah, I mean, the, just simply, I mean, MIMO today, generally, when you have the MIMO off the AP going to the handset, it's a single user. So, you know, it, it you know, does kind of like a device at a time, device at a time. With multi-user, all of a sudden, now the AP can address, send out multiple streams to multiple users at once. So think about instead of the AP serving a single person at a time, it now can, say, serve four people at a time. So with that, I mean, I think that's going to be kind of important feature that, that needs to be looked at in terms of, you know, now that you have all these iPhones out there, um, you have, you know, the single stream coming from each one, that the fact that, you know, the, the access point can handle more people, you know, so I think that that's going to be an important technology to look at. I mean, it's just kind of coming out now, um, but I think that is certainly, you know, and from my indication, that's one of the things that a lot of the uh, carriers have been kind of waiting for on AC to come out before they start making their investments. Okay, great, thanks. And, and Bruce, where are you with MU-MIMO? Is it something that your customers understand the value of? Yeah, I, I think uh, next year is, is really where you're going to see the, the MU-MIMO um, you know, hit the enterprise market. There are some customers we have that, are, that are, have been kind of waiting uh, to upgrade until then. You know, we have an architecture that kind of allows a module or swap out so we can, they can buy today and upgrade later, which is, which is one of the, uh, the key components uh, to kind of a long-term you know, investment strategy. So, but but you know to to Daryl's point you know I think this is this is an important thing um, if you look at the smartphones and even the six in particular they are all single stream single antenna devices and so Moomimo is actually very well suited to smartphones because I can put four of those on one channel it's kind of like moving from a hub to a switch in the Ethernet world um, I can now start to support greater densities so I think this will actually improve the density support for things like smartphones more than any other technology that's come out to date. Um, because now you're able to share that bandwidth, so it's it's definitely a, a very interesting for for this type of uh, device. You know, talking specifically about the six or, or other or other smartphones in general, um, and I think will help. But um, you know, there's there's a little bit of time yet before this technology matures and hits the mainstream. But you know, we are looking at next year probably for most enterprise players at this point. Okay, excellent, Bruce Miller of Xeris. Any final thoughts on the iPhone six and its impact on Wi-Fi? Yeah, I think that um, you know if you if you look at the the six, it, it actually kind of ups the ante for smartphones. It, it it you know you can call it a phablet or whatever at the top end maybe, but um, you know the larger the device, the more um, media it consumes, the more bandwidth it's going to use. And I think that more so than previous generations, this this device will be tasking carrier and Wi-Fi networks. There is no doubt more than more than an impact more than any other device that uh, that uh, Apple's put out as far as incrementally, you know, generation to generation. So we see that yeah. for sure, um, and I think people need to be ready for that. Carriers in general are probably a little bit more prepared in the sense that they, you know, they know there's 100 million devices going to be hitting their network in six months, you know, which is kind of the pro pro you know the projections. Um, but a lot of Wi-Fi networks are not sitting there looking at that, and I, I believe that. Uh, there's probably going to be a rude awakening in some cases where people realize how much you know these things are are uh, looking more almost like a tablet in terms of the way they consume data. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see how that uh, how that works out. But um, you know, great for the user, tougher for the uh, for the networks that they're running on. I think is going to be the the bottom line with this device. 
Yeah, well, great, great for the user if everything works, but but nobody so, likes you know, <laughs> buffering video and files that don't download. Daryl, do you think we're going to see problems? Um, seems like uh, yeah, you always see some sort of problem when you have a launch of this nature, this size. I mean, I, I think they, one of the th things you're going to kind of notice. I mean, obviously, one, you know, the more these devices get in people's hands, the more problems people will discover, more use cases that they weren't used. Secondly, I think it might actually make the end user more of aware of the different quality of Wi-Fi networks out there as you really get down to more sensitive type applications or you know even more in the expectation in the home that maybe or at work you've had this higher streaming ability on your phone but then you go to out say less robust public access points and don't see it. So I think, think you might actually create a greater awareness of the gap of the different quality of Wi-Fi networks out there in the end user's perspective. Okay, great. Daryl Schooler from Open. Thanks so much for being here. Sure, thanks. All right, this has been RCR Insights. Thank you all very much.